This is an example video from ES6 in practice containing the solution of five exercises. In this course, you can learn and master the new version of JavaScript from a practical point of view. We all know how frustrating it is to read a book or watch a course revealing all the nitpicky details without giving you the chance to put theory into practice. Theory explaining the useful parts of the language is important. What most people don't know, that the brain is not a hard drive. You cannot retrieve any sector at any time. Our brain works like associative memory does. You can retrieve information by forming associations. ES6 in practice helps you develop useful associations by giving you the experience of solving some exercises. You can then see my reference solutions and compare them with yours. Watch these five exercises from the book. If you like them, you will find 54 more exercises in the course. Although many of the videos are not yet ready, you can purchase the course at a discount. As I upload more and more videos, the price of the course will continuously increase. We will now solve 5 exercises using the spread operator and rest parameters. In exercise 1, we will make a shallow copy of an array using one destructuring assignment. When cloning objects and arrays in JavaScript, we can either make a deep or a shallow copy of the original object. I will use a surprising resource for illustrating the difference between deep and shallow copies. This resource is pythontutor.com. Yes, even JavaScript developers can learn things from a Python site. We will select JavaScript among the visualization options. Let's define a shallow clone method using the popular ES5 way of array.slice0. The solution is all over the first page of Google when searching for how to clone an array in JavaScript. A possible way of making a deep copy is using JSON stringify and JSON parse. They are inverse transformations of each other, so we recursively transform our array or object into an intermediate format and rebuild the same object from scratch. Cloning is deep because it takes place on all levels, while a shallow copy only takes place on top level. This method works as long as our object has an equivalent JSON representation. The data structure should be finite and it should not contain functions. We will now define a simple array of users in the code editor. I will make myself an admin and add an editor, Julia. Let's shallow clone and deep clone our array. Once we are done, we can let Python tutor figure out the structure of our references in memory. Great! Python tutor is done. Let's move to the end of the shallow copy operation. As you can see, shallow users is a brand new array, but its elements are the same as the elements of the original users array. Copying is shallow because only the top-level references were copied. After executing the deep clone operation, we can conclude that a brand new data structure was created on all levels. The primitive values are equal, but the references are unique. After this brief introduction, let's use the spread operator to define our shallow clone function. This is your last chance to pause this exercise if you want to solve it yourself. Let's see how we can use the spread operator instead of the slice method to clone an array. All we need to do is enumerate all the elements of the array in the return value of shallow clone using the spread operator. Let's change this line in the editor and observe that the results are identical as before. In real life, we often get away with shallow copying objects as long as we define our data structures properly. However, be careful because shallow cloning may give you unwanted side effects. Changing an element from the cloned reference changes the corresponding value accessible from the original reference. As we learned destructuring in the last lesson, we can put it into practice again with the spread operator. In this destructuring assignment, we disassemble the original array and rebuild it on the left in a new array reference. The result is again a shallow copy of the original array. Moving on to exercise 2. Let's determine the value of array A without executing the code. 
First of all, function f returns an array of 5 elements, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 in string form. Yes, the spread operator spreads the string into an array of characters. f.mapf is nothing else but 1, 2, 3, 4, 5.mapf. The actual values of the array on the left hand side don't matter. They will be thrown away by the map function f as f takes zero arguments. Only the length of the array matters, which is 5. Therefore, the map function creates an array of length 5, where each element is the same as the return value of f. This is what our result look like, and console.table prints a 5 times 5 two-dimensional array of vectors 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. We are done with exercise 2. In the third exercise, our task is to create a 10 times 10 matrix of null values. Well, we have just solved a similar exercise, haven't we? Instead of function f, we will now define a more semantic get null vector function. In the return value, we create an array of length 10 and fill each value with null. We will use the exact same trick as before to define a null matrix. We build an array of length 10 and map each element onto a vector of 10 nulls. Executing the console.log expression shows you that the solution is correct again. Three out of five exercises are done. In exercise four, we revisit the sum arcs function from earlier in the course. The ES5 implementation looks like this. Let's make this implementation shorter by using rest parameters and arrow functions. We will define a rest parameter numbers and then use the reduce method on the numbers array to sum its elements. Reduce is a function with two arguments. The first argument is a function transforming an accumulator and the upcoming element of the array to a new accumulator value. The second argument is the initial value of the accumulator. The second argument is optional. If initial value is provided during the first execution, accumulator will be equal to the initial value and current value will be equal to the first value in the array. When initial value is not provided, Accumulator will be the first element of the array and current value will be the second element in the first execution of reduce. We can omit the optional accumulator value and we can also make some arcs an arrow function to reach the most compact form of the solution. The solution works flawlessly. If you want to keep track of each execution of reduce, add the console log in the function body. You can keep track of how the accumulator changes during execution. If we add an initial value, execution changes. The fifth and last exercise is tricky. Your task is to return the longest common substring of two string arguments of max common. When the solution works correctly, the function returns these results. I will start the exercise for you. Your task is to complete it. Let me preframe that my intention is not to give you an efficient solution, but to illustrate the spread operator and rest parameters in depth. If you're interested in algorithmic complexity, research dynamic programming and then try to solve the same exercise using the principles that you learned there. We will waste a lot of resources in this solution by recalculating the same results over and over again. Let's define the argument list of max common in a way that we can easily access the head and the tail of the arrays. By definition, the head of the array is its first element, while the tail of the array is the rest of the array, excluding the first element. The tail of the arrays are denoted by rest parameters. We can obviously use rest parameters as a string is spread into an array of characters in ES6. We will also define an optional length argument initialized to zero. This is because we will use a recursive solution to compare the results. The length parameter stores the number of matching characters right before the two examined strings. Whenever we solve a problem recursively, there is always an exit condition. Your task is to determine what we should do once we run out of elements in one of the strings. If we still have elements in both arrays, there are two options. 
the hats are either equal or not. When the hats are equal, determine what we should return. When they are not equal, we take one element either from the left array or from the right array and compute the maximum length in each branch, recursively calling the same maxcommon function. We return the maximum of three values, the number of matching characters so far, which is len, and the maximum length calculated by the two recursive calls. If you would like to implement the missing pieces, pause the video now and open the code example. Welcome back. Our exit condition is simply return len. In other words, we return the number of matching characters right before one of the strings became empty. If both strings are non-empty and the hats match, we recursively call max common on the tails of the strings and increase len by one. If the hats don't match, we remove one character from either the first string or from the second string and calculate their max common score with len initialized to zero. The longest string may either be in one of these branches or it is equal to the current value of len. As I said before, this is a clever but highly inefficient solution. If the length of the strings are k and l respectively, we need a magnitude of k factorial times l factorial steps. This is a lot, especially that we can solve the exercise using a magnitude of k times l steps using dynamic programming. I highly recommend researching the topic. So these were the five exercises, I hope you liked them, and if you're interested in learning more, sign up for the course. See you inside, take care.